for the first time, I think, reporting a crime, I really understood the true terror of what, of what it means for a man to kill the mother of his children. This family will never recover from it. And I, I wanted to sort of go to that place of being really hurt by it in order to make the story what it, what it needed to be in order to, to serve Elena. On December 1st, 2016, police found the body of Dr. Elena Frick. Her husband, Dr. Mohammed Shamji, was arrested the next day. The murder and the arrest made sensational headlines with the press obsessing over Shamji, a neurosurgeon whose life took a horrific and shocking turn. Elena's life, her successes, and the violence that she endured seemed to slip into the background. Journalist Michael Lista wanted to tell a different story, to give an account that centered around Elena's experience. A year after her murder, he published Love and Death in Toronto Life, an intimate study of an abusive marriage. He then featured that story in his new book, The Human Scale. Michael, welcome to Crime Story. It's good to be here, Kathleen. Thanks for having me. So tell me about Dr. Elena Frick. So Dr. Elena Frick was a deeply beloved, incredibly accomplished family doctor. Her parents were Croatian immigrants who worked on the auto lines in Windsor. And um, from the time that she was a young girl, she had ambitions to sort of, you know, live a different kind of life and um, excelled at school. Besides being, you know, a, an accomplished doctor, she later went and did a, um, uh, a degree in public policy at Duke, where, um, you know, we spoke to a number of her, of her friends and colleagues. She wasn't simply um, brilliant, um, wasn't simply a devoted mother. She was, she was also um, kind of the life of the party. Anyone who met Elena couldn't help, as one person said, couldn't help sort of falling in love with her. And so she was, she was just, you know, a very, a very um, brilliant, kind, funny human being. And a very special, lovely person, but whose life ended very violently at yeah. the hands of her husband. So tell yeah. me about him. Sure. So, so when Elena was, um, uh, was working at a hospital in Ottawa, um, one day there was like a sort of rec room there. And one day at the other end of a pool table, which they had there, um, she spotted this man named Muhammad Shamji. And Shamji, like Elena, was, um, was, you know, thought of as a kind of intellectual academic star. Um, he had a very different background than Elena's, whereas Elena's you know, was a more working class, blue collar um, uh, upbringing. Muhammad Shamji came from, uh, you know, essentially Ottawa gentry. His father was um, a man named uh, Dr. Fareed Shamji, who um, was a thoracic surgeon who had a sort of, I think it's a prize named after him at, hmm. um, at the hospital. Uh, went to very um, elite, prestigious in institutions. He went to Ashbury College. Um, a very tough school to get into, um, uh, and then uh, went on to Yale, um, uh, st uh, studied medicine at Queens, um, and ended up becoming a, a neurosurgeon. Um, but he had this side that, um, that no one except Elena really saw. But despite all his accomplishments, he was an incredibly violent man who almost immediately after he started dating Elena and um, began abusing her. Um, and like many, many women who are the victims of domestic violence, um, Elena, for a whole host of complicated reasons, um, tried to keep it a secret and did a pretty good job, um, so much so that um, the people closest to her sort of knew that Muhammad, who um, was sort of um, called Mo by his friends and by Elena, um, they, that he could be sort of tempestuous and volatile, but they had no idea the history of violence that stalked Elena all her life. Um, and um, in, in late November 2016, um, as Elena was preparing to leave Muhammad, he murdered her one night in their bedroom. Um, as one of their daughters was awake and um, cowering in her room listening. Um, he, when we reported the story, we reported that, he, that she had died of blunt force trauma, um, which was only sort of true. Elena used to joke, she joked on social media that um, 
that her husband, towards the end of their relationship, they both started taking jujitsu. And, um, and she once joked, she said, you posted a picture of him and said, you know, um, Dr. Mo, he can break your neck and then fix it too. And we found out when he pled guilty that he had, he had broken her neck. Oh. Yeah. And then he stuffed her in a suitcase and discarded her like trash on the side of the Humber River in Kleinberg. And it, it wasn't just a suitcase, it was, it was her suitcase. Um, and it bore a little luggage tag on it that, that, that had the, the ancestral town of where her, where her family is from. Horrendous. Yep. Her life ended so violently, but we mm -hmm. know often that violence starts out, domestic violence starts mm -hmm. out kind of slowly yes. and builds. So do mm -hmm. we, w with your investigation, did mm -hmm. you learn about how the domestic yeah. violence in her home began? It mm -hmm. sort of, you saw the rolling increases? Yes. So, so there, there were sort of two ways that we, that we went about investigating Elena's life and and the sort of story of their their violent marriage I mean one was one was through you know just sort of conversations with those closest to her um, but you know what was what was difficult is that um, to a lot of the people close to Elena they only started putting together some of the stories after she had been killed um, and realized that this this sort of this little um, this little cut she had that accident she had they weren't accidents at all um, and then the other way that we that we went about doing it is we is you know we we went to look in in the public record for um, for any um, any interaction with police or the courts so so it started as you say as as most almost all domestic violence does it started small and at first it was um, you know, uh, it was sort of verbal abuse, calling her names, calling her family names. Her parents remember one night when when they were first when they first started to get serious. I believe it was before they got married. They had gone back home to to the home where Elena grew up in Windsor for the first time. Mo was very um, he he wouldn't he wouldn't really engage with with the rest of the family who were all sort of playing board games and and having fun. He was he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So you could say that it all kind of flows out of this overbearing sort of sense of control that he always was exerting on Elena. What to eat, who their who their children can hang out with, whether or not she was allowed to get a subscription to the Globe and Mail, which she was not. Um, uh, and and then it and then as it always does it escalates. So um, uh, as far back as the f the first concrete example of very serious violence was when um, they were newly married. Their first child um, was nine months old, and they got into a, f a physical altercation where Mo ended up punching her, hitting her in some way, and splitting her lip, and threatening her threatening to kill her and um, and it resulted in three criminal charges the police charged him um, uh, one was uh, a, uh, an assault charge and two were threats of uh, uttering bodily harm very serious charges what happened was that Muhammad was about to go to um, North Carolina to Duke to uh, to do a, a PhD and Elena, being Elena, decided that, well, she wasn't just going to wait around, um, you know, just, you know, sort of bum around Durham by herself, not doing anything. She was going to study, too. And so she went to go get a, a master's degree. And then this assault happened. Um, the charges were laid. Um, and if, you know, as is so often the case, the only witness, the only way that, 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 this, that this crime can be prosecuted is if Elena testifies, right? Uh, which, if she was going to do, it would, I mean, it would mean, mean the end of her marriage, which she was very, very proud of, even though even though it was, she thought of it as something I was told, um, that it was something she could fix. This was a fixable problem, right? She never thought of herself as a victim, right? And, um, and it would also mean the end of Muhammad's career because he wouldn't be able to, if the charge is stuck, he wouldn't be able to cross the border and he wouldn't be able to practice medicine. And so in this attempt to, to sort of, um, the, way she, the way it was described to me, in, in, in an attempt to sort of keep everything together, 
fight for this marriage that she still cared about. And then also, you know, remember, she's under she's under the control of a violent man. She decided not to proceed with the charges and they were dropped. And um, and then the violence just kept getting worse and they were together for, you know, another 12 years. So if she hasn't hadn't told anybody and charges were dropped, how did police zero in on the husband quite so quickly? Muhammad ended up pleading guilty to the charges years later, so we didn't see all the evidence. But from what we can tell, I mean, first of all, the first the first subject in any murder is a spouse, right? Of course. Um, um, we do know that towards the end of her life, Elena had retained a, a divorce lawyer and was getting ready to to leave him. And part of the reason was that she was now, once she finally decided to leave, she was telling people that he had been violent with her all her life. And um, and her lawyer knew it, her friends knew it, her family knew it. Um, they, 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 all, they didn't all know the, the totality of it. They, you know, they, they all didn't have the same stories. But it was very clear. And as I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, they, the police interviewed the children and their eldest daughter heard Muhammad killing her. And the incredible thing is, I mean, those, I, I didn't, I deliberately didn't interview um, the, the children. Um, uh, I just, I didn't think it would be proper for me to do it. Um, I also didn't want to imperil um, the prosecution. But you did speak to her parents. Yes. You did finally speak to her parents. And I know that yeah. it took you a while and there was quite a lot of care that you put into developing the relationship with them. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of the way yeah. that you reached out to them and the way that you, the yeah. two, the three of you be, got to the point where mm -hmm. you felt you could meet in person and talk yeah. to each other? Yeah, so, you know, when I started to reach out to, to people online, um, you know, who were her friends and colleagues who were upset with the coverage, um, the early coverage of her, they would all do the same thing thing they would say they would say I'd be willing to speak to you but first I have to ask uh, Elena's parents permission Joe and Anna and so they knew that this was going on and they were giving permission at their blessing um, to friends and um, uh, and and then later her sister um, to, to talk and it was only after I think um, you know they had a sense of how I worked that they that they were willing to to talk, and yet, we, as as you say, we started on the phone, um, and then they were living in Toronto. Um, they were living in in Elaine and Muhammad's house. Um, the girls were still going to school, and they, how many children did they have? Three. So they had two two girls and and a little boy. Um, and and so, in order to as as they sort of. Um, uh, described it in order to sort of maintain as normal a life as as possible for the kids, so as not to disrupt their routines and stuff like that. They lived in the house while they were trying to sell it. I mean, in the house where Elena was killed, um, and that's where we, we would meet at the kitchen table. Um, the girls were, you know, they were either at school or sent away when we would talk because they were old enough to sort of understand what was going on. But the the little the little boy was, I think he was just, I don't think he was three yet, um, when she was killed, and he would be there. And we were spending so much time with each other around the kitchen table, um, you know, d sort of d telling the story, not, not just of her death, but of her life, that um, one of the last times I went over to, to see them, um, the you know, the little boy, Elena and Mohammed's son was there. And um, Elena's mom said to him in this kind of firm but commanding way, say hello to Uncle Michael. And it was one of these moments as as uh, as a reporter where you're where you're sort of like, like, oh, my God, like, have I gotten too close? Like, is do, I, I don't want to be called Uncle Michael. But at the same time, it kind of reflects something that I wasn't sort of willing to admit that, like, Part of the reason why I think the story ended up being what it is 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 because um, is be, is because I did care that much. I always wondered why journalism and objectivity mm -hmm. got interpreted as not caring. Right. And right. I don't think that's true. And I right. and I think that there is a right and wrong on this side of this story. Yeah. There's no objectivity. Yeah. 
And so I think we as journalists get so caught up in this yeah. idea of how we should behave that we forget that the reason we got into it is because mm -hmm. we actually care about humanity. That's <laughs> or it. most of us. That's it. Yes, being dispassionate doesn't mean being um, uninterested. No, you know? and the best of us are yeah. caring and passionate people, I think. I think so. Um, you mentioned uh, that one of your concerns was interfering with the prosecution mm -hmm. and the daughter who was unfortunately a witness. Can you explain that a little bit more? What was your, what were you worried about yeah. and what was happening there? Yeah. So I think the fear, the fear always is that you, so we did most of the interviews on background. Um, Which means what? Just explain yeah. to people what that means. So, so on, um, so when, when, you know, the, there are different ways in which you can get information and relay it to um, your reader. Uh, you know, on the record is where we know who the reader knows who the source is. We'll often quote directly from them. On background is when, you know, if a source tells me, you know, I drive a red car, you know, then I can say, you know, he drives a red car, but the the reader won't know where the where the information is coming from and who the source of it is, right? So I did a lot of the story that way, um, in part because I mean, in magazine writing, we do more sort of um, r reporting on background because it reads sort of better as a as a sort of piece of nonfiction as a story. But it was also for a practical reason because I was talking to some people whose identity I didn't want to be. Um, you know, revealed, um, because then I didn't want, and, and this was especially true with, um, with the daughter who, who witnessed the, um, the murder to whom I didn't speak. But the reason why I didn't is because I didn't want a defense attorney to be able to say, you know, on, you know, in, in this, you know, Toronto Life article here, brandishing it at court, um, you said that you walked into the, into the room and saw your mother being killed at two o'clock, but you know, we know now it wasn't two o'clock. It was, it was one fifty, right? You're getting your fact about this wrong. What side of the bed did you say she was on? You know, you just testified five minutes ago to this and yet you told Toronto life this, right? Therefore, why should we believe anything you say? Right? It's like a, it's a classic bit of, of uh, defense lawyering, which, you know, if you're the defendant, you want your lawyer to do, but it, but I, but I didn't want to introduce that, that sort of avenue of um, of attack, that sort of legal sophistry in order to get Muhammad off, because if that happened, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Not, I mean, the, the fact that, that this young woman was willing to testify, she was ready to testify, to send her father to prison for the rest of his life. How you know, old was she? Oh, I think by the time the trial came around, she was, I think she was 14. Still a child still a child but it, but my god you know when when i went to i remember the day going to court when he was sentenced and they were there and it was the first time i met them i didn't i, I, I didn't meet i didn't meet the girls until until the sentencing and she was very small looked so small it was in one of those cavernous courtrooms on uh, on university avenue the big one um Everyone looks small in there. I think they build them like that for a reason, I think right? So too, yeah. <laughs> um, but she looked tiny, but had this immense maturity and resolve. Looked so much like a perfect mix of her parents, hmm. you know, one, one of whom killed the other, and she was ready to send, send, send him, send him to prison. I just, I, I've never. It, it was profoundly moving, profoundly moving, and um, and I, I admire her. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm horrified for what happened to her, but I admire her in a way I, I don't admire many people. And I want to talk about that day, but just mm -hmm. quickly, she didn't have to testify because he pled guilty. Yeah. Yep. He pled guilty. So, so he, you know, to uh, to second degree murder. Um, so it's still a life sentence, um, but he's he's eligible for parole earlier than he would have been if if he had gone to trial and lost. So I think it's, he's eligible in tw 12 years, something like that, mm -hmm. instead of 25. Um, whether or not, I mean, he'll ever be granted parole is, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I, I think it's, it's fairly unlikely, but, um, but we'll, you know, we'll see. I've read a few incidents where you talk about being in the court that day. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you write very viscerally. I, I get a sense of it. But what was it like? You say you saw his daughter for the first time, but it's also the time you saw him for the first time. Yes. So can you tell me what that was like? Yeah, he... Um, I think these... I think bad guys... Bad guys always seem bigger in your mind. Always. Right? And it's always shocking. I mean, I've been doing this for a while now. It's always shocking to to really see how human they are. So I was sitting on the right side of the courtroom, which is, it was weird. It was sort of like, a, in, in an odd way, it was like a, like the sort of chiral molecule, like the sort of inside out sort of photo negative of like a wedding because all of Elena's family was sitting on one side and even the reporters were sitting on that side. And then on the left side were um, Muhammad's family. Um, his his parents were there, and I think his uncle, um, and that and that's pretty much it. And um, and he at one point he just before uh, the, so the the victim impact statements were read first, right? Where a lot of my sources, you know, came up and and you know said what what this murder meant to them and what Elena meant to them. And then Muhammad was given a chance to talk, and he was wearing a suit. He was shorter than I had imagined, very thin. He had been thin most of his life because he was a, a, a long distance runner. Mm. But it looked like he had lost even more weight in prison. Um, a not, in a weird way, a not unhandsome man. He looked like someone, again, from the outside that you wouldn't think of as, as being so repellent on the inside. So he turned and he, he, looked, he looked to the right to where his children were sitting. He started to talk to them and he said, you know, I've devastated your lives. I know it must be hard for you to look at me, um, but I think about you daily. Um, and, you know, no, no words, no words can um, reflect, you know, the, the horror and shame I feel, but I'll try. And he had this incredible pinched expression on his face. Um, and, and then he started to cry. And I couldn't see the expressions of his daughters, but I could see where they got their expressions from. Some of them were from him. And it was just this incredible, terrifying, heartbreaking, um, you know, and deeply human moment where, you, you know, these people loom so large in our imagination, but they are they are flesh and blood, just like us, and they have to stand in a room all by themselves, you know? And you described writing the article and then mm -hmm. as a bit of a nightmare for you. Why? Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't my my first murder. <laughs> um, it was my I think by that time it was my third. And you, you know, you, you sort of, you know, you sort of like to tell yourself, oh, you know, I'm a pro. I'm like a, you know, like I'm a gr grizzled, seasoned, you know, crime reporter. This stuff doesn't bother me. Um, murders have a weird way of creeping up on you, like um, emotionally, and um, and it it was the, the 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 more information I got. I, you know, I felt I felt these two competing things. As a reporter, you're like, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm, I have like, I'm going to get the access I need to do this story justice. This is great. But you're also, you know, you're like a, you're like an empty cup that's being filled with with the pain and anguish of these people who you come to care about. Um, and and then you know, I remember like I could sort of like I would kind of like. Um, could almost like see Elena in my mind mm. after a while you know like I felt I felt like I knew her and and I I started to have really bad anxiety um about a whole bunch of different stuff like I mean one was getting the story right like I really wanted like knowing that I that I had the story that no other reporter had the sort of access that I had I knew I had to do it right and for me that means making people care not just getting it right Right. But it means like make, making people, making readers really care about it. Right. I mean, when you launch one of these stories into the into the news cycle, you know, there's so much there's so much churn. There's so much information. So you're competing with your comp the way I think of, of reporting is that you're not just competing with other 
news stories for people's attention. You're competing with like Facebook and TikTok and PlayStation. Like, I want, I want, I want this. I want the story to have as much adhesive on it that people's eyeballs, once they lay their eyes on them, they can't unpeel them. Um, and that, but then I started to worry about, oh my God, like, like, you know, what if I, what if I screw up the prosecution? I, you know, the anxiety just sort of became like kind of generalized, and and it was. You know, I uh, there was a moment when I kind of passed through the sort of um, the the looking glass, and for the first time, I think reporting a crime, I really understood the true terror of what of what it means for a man to kill the mother of his children. You know, and how scared Elena must have been. This family will never recover from it, and I, I wanted to sort of go to that place of being really hurt by it in order to make the story what it what it needed to be in order to to serve Elena. Was it worthwhile for you? I I think so. I didn't even realize the true crime boom was happening when when I sort of when it when it was happening around me, you know, I was just, you know, I was doing these stories because to me they are incredibly important. I mean, before the true crime boom, you know, like as reporters, you didn't want to be called a crime journalist. It was like the desk you wanted to get off of. No, like I liked it. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could tell. <laughs> um, but um, but to me, I always thought it was, you know, like I, I think there's nothing more interesting than than what makes people do these horrible things to one another. You know, I mean, it, it to me, it's. It's the same reason why Macbeth is so interesting, you know? It's, you know, every crime in one way or another and our reaction to it as, um, you know, d the, the sort of the political reaction, the jurisprudential reaction, the emotional reaction is is a reflection of who we are as, as a people, as a city, as a country, right? I was thinking the exact same thing. I mean, I don't think there's a true, there's a true crime boom in podcasting. Right. There's not a true crime boom right. in humanity. Right. It's right. always been on the right. front pages of every newspaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, we spend so much of our energy trying yeah. to figure out how to punish, how to yeah. mitigate, how to yeah. deal with something that was unfair yeah. and somehow make it fair. Yeah. Um, and I do think that every crime at its core is about who we are mm -hmm. as, human as humans. I agree. And so for me... Yeah, I know why I like uh, absorbing these stories and I know mm -hmm. why I like reporting these stories, but mm -hmm. what do you think is important about telling these stories? That's a great question. It seems like such an easy question. Now I'm sort of <laughs> fumbling around for the right answer. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I like just, I like, I like the, 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 um, the task of getting the facts right. I mean, I, there's something, I mean, obviously that's why we sort of went into the, the work that we did, right? I mean, like getting the facts right is is deeply satisfying um, because it's there's there's something unimpeachable about it. It's like this is whatever whatever you think about it. This is what happened. This is the world we inhabit right now, right? Um, to me, to me, you know, I get a little bit nervous when I see some of the true crime products that are the sort of result of the boom, where it's a little bit boozy where it's you know a little bit buttoned down sometimes like like a little bit a little bit too droll for my taste you know what i mean um i t i take this i take this this as like a sort of very sacred duty doing this doing this kind of work because you know when you when you sort of pass that looking glass you know the way i was uh, i was sort of talking about earlier and you reach that kind of that sort of moment of like terror where you realize you're really talking about then I think what happens is that it transforms your approach to to not just the way you do your job, but the way you like think about an English sentence, right? I mean, if the the, the true crime writers who I really loved are the ones who can who can um, dilate on real people as um, and and the and the way that you describe them, the way that you set the scene, the way that you sort of paint their portrait in the same way that like a fiction writer would with 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 a subject who exists purely in his mind you know i want to be that close to people because because i think if you want to understand what crime really means you have to understand that it is a it is about especially a murder it is about a human being being obliterated by another human being it's like it's like a library being burned to the ground you know um it's 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 really profound and and so you know if i can 
I like doing this job when I can get that close. The only time it's unsatisfying is when I don't get is when I don't get that moment with with my sources, with the subject, right? When it's when it's just when I'm just telling a story that I that I'm not that doesn't keep me up at night, I'm not interested in it. So would you have approached the story any differently with hindsight now? Do you feel like you did it properly? I don't mean to to make this sound too aesthetic, but it but it presented a sort of stylistic challenge that I've wrestled with. Um, so part of the thing that allowed me to get the access that I did um, uh, was because I was planning on writing this the story in a certain way, which is um, by making Elena, the victim, the center of the story, the protagonist of her story. Now, this was, this is, you know, it's sometimes called um, uh, vi- victim-centric crime reporting. For some people, it's for political reasons, right? Um, we should we shouldn't we shouldn't focus on on uh, on these horrible horrible people. Um, instead, we should focus on victims. The reason why I was doing it was not for that political reason, um, and it wasn't just for uh, the expedience of getting the sources I wanted. It was also because I wanted to understand how a marriage like this could um, could how it works, right? And the only way to do it was to get, I, I tried to get inside Muhammad's mind, his family refused to speak to us. So the only mind I really had access to was kind of Elena's. But then when, once, the, w- once I started writing it, then I started to worry, I was like, oh my God, am I, by, by making her the protagonist, am I implicating her as like the engine of her own demise? I don't know. I hope I think I didn't do it. I hope I didn't do it, but um, but you know, it 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 taught me something sort of true about narrative. I mean, we write crime stories with with perpetrators, with villains as the protagonists for a reason because they are plot machines. They're the ones who make the consequential decisions, right? So there's like there's this kind of like narrative truth about about a crime story that 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 you almost can't alter in the way that I tried to here. So I guess to, to, to answer your question more briefly, it's that it, I, I, would, I think I would have worked harder to try and get Muhammad's family um, on board and, and maybe even he himself. But again, any defense attorney worth, worth their salt will not let their client talk to a reporter bef- like while they're you know awaiting trial. Um, uh, I would have had to sit on it for years. Right. Okay, well, maybe there's a follow up. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you. This has been oh, fascinating. It's been totally my pleasure. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks.